from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Of course, you all know Diana's books or you wouldn't be here, but let me say just a few words about her and her remarkably original novels. They're a bit science fiction, a lot historical fiction, and they're all infused with fantasy, military fiction, and a very appealing dose of romance. A novel by, Do by uh, Diana is a genre all to itself, and that unique approach to large canvas, big-brained, open-hearted storytelling has won her millions of readers worldwide. She's an Arizona native, part Anglo-American. Thank you, Arizona, yes. Um, <laughs> part, part Mexican-American. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in zoology, a master's in marine biology, and a PhD in animal behavior, as well as being an expert in scientific computation and microcomputing. But don't let that scare you. Uh, she has also spent her early career as a comic book scriptwriter, and in many ways, uh, she is a woman for all seasons and a writer for all ages. As her reviewers have said, Diana writes books that sell like crazy and have gathered devoted readers from every corner of fandom. By several reckonings, the Outlander series has sold about 28 million books. I had 25, but she corrected me. <laughs> Since Diana's first novel was published in 1991, the series has been translated into 43 different languages. You all know the titles, Dragonfly in Amber, Voyager, The Scottish Prisoner, The Fiery Cross, An Echo in the Bone, Written in My Own Heart's Blood, just to mention a few. They have all been New York Times bestsellers, they have won many prizes, and they have been called breakneck, rip-roaring, and totally addictive. At the end of the talk, you'll have a chance to pose a question to Diana at one of the microphones you see set up in the aisles. So save up your thoughts and ideas. I need to tell you, though, you'll be on camera and archived in the Library of Congress into perpetuity. <laughs> so make that question a smart one. <laughs> you'll also have a chance to have Diana sign your books at her 1 o'clock uh, signing session down on the lower level. So without further ado, please welcome our author of the moment. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to remember big-brained, open-hearted storytelling for my next cover blurb. Uh, but uh, thank you so much uh, to the organizers and to all of the wonderful volunteers who have kept me from getting lost this morning, uh, or at least have recovered me when I was lost. And uh, thank you to all of you who could, you know, just as easily be at home washing your cars or something. I'm glad you came to see me instead. Uh, back in the day when I would go out at night to do events and uh, talk to people, my husband would say to me, well, doesn't it bother you having to go out and talk to all of these totally strange people? I think he meant total strangers. And, uh, <laughs> I said, well, uh, no. I said, you know, I've been a university professor for a long time. I'm kind of used to talking to large crowds. And I said, if I can keep people awake at 8 o'clock in the morning talking about human anatomy and physiology, I can probably keep them awake at 8 o'clock in the evening if they came on purpose to hear me. Back in the day, I would tell very large crowds, maybe 400 or so, because human anatomy and physiology, one of my classes, was a very popular one. Everybody took it as a science elective, including the football team, because they thought it would be easy. I mean, how hard can it be? Count your fingers. <laughs> but um, anyway, they would all show up in the morning. It was an early class. And they'd all sit in the front row, sound asleep, these large inanimate blobs of flesh. And I would be standing on a podium like this, so I would step up and say, this morning, gentlemen, we're going to discuss the history of contraception. And they would all start blinking. <laughs> say, in days of old, when knights were bold and condoms not invented, they wrapped old socks around their cocks and babies were prevented. <laughs> Yes. 
<laughs> well, it worked on the football players, too. <laughs> now, people always say to me, uh, well, how did you get from being a scientist, you know, with all these degrees and things, to being a novelist? And I say, well, easy, I wrote a book. I mean, they don't make you get a license. <laughs> no, but what they, what they actually mean is, well, science seems all cold and clinical and orderly and tidy and white-coated and, you know, cold. And uh, writing, you know, it's this creative thing. It must be all wonderful and colorful and warm and fuzzy and so forth. I'd say, well, <laughs> no. Um, the thing is, science and art both are two sides of the same coin. They both rest on the same thing, which is the ability to perceive patterns and draw patterns out of chaos. When you do science, you define your chaos by the choice of, of subject, you know, your organism, your ecosystem, whatever you're studying. And then within that, you try to define and pick out the patterns and explicate them to people. Same thing when you do a novel. Then you're defining your chaos by the subject that you choose or the the genre, but also you include your own internal chaos as part of that subject, and you try to make the patterns equivalent. Well, in science, you come up with a hypothesis. You say, I think this is what's happening in my system, and then you try to support it by means of experiment. Well, your novel is your hypothesis, and your experiment is the audience. So you release it upon your audience, and you see whether they see the same patterns you do, which, you know, evidently you do, so thanks. <laughs> but as to how I got here, well, I've known since about the age of eight that I was meant to be a novelist. This was the age at which I realized that people write books, that they don't just pop out of the, out of the shelves like you know, toilet paper in the grocery store. And uh, so I said, well, um, yeah, I think, I think that's what I should do. I was actually having a, a conversation with God about it one day. I was raised as a Catholic, and they told us, you know, you do, it's not just to organize prayers. You know, you should talk to God about your life and so forth. So at the age of eight, I was kind of doing that. We were driving somewhere with my, uh, with my parents, and I was looking at the clouds and so forth. And yeah, I was just talking to God. Anyway, I said, you know, I think I, I'm thinking I kind of want to write books, you know, that would kind of lift people up. That was my best uh, description of escape fiction, you know, think a story that would lift people out of themselves and give them a new experience. Anyway, God said, yeah. I I think that's a good idea. So, you know, <laughs> I kind of, people said, well, how did you find the nerve, you know, to, to do this? And I said, I was supposed to do this. <laughs> that's not a problem. But uh, of course, the problem is always how, because when you set out to write a book, there are no roadmaps. I uh, was once in, in Germany doing a, uh, a book tour and the publisher and the publicist and you know, all these news people took me out to lunch together and they started asking, well, how did you do this? How did you write your novel? And so I explained to them what I'm about to explain to you and they were all shocked. You know, They said, no one in Germany would dream of trying to write a novel without first getting a PhD in literature. And I said, that's probably why two thirds of the authors in your catalog are Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I did not actually say that because I have better manners, but, you know, that's what I thought. <laughs> anyway, the thing is that anyone who writes a novel is going to kind of figure it out for themselves. You know, if you want to be a dentist or a lawyer or a doctor or something, there is a set uh, curriculum that you take. You have to enroll in this particular school. You have to take these particular classes. You pass these particular formal exams, and they give you a certificate that says, now you are allowed to be a doctor or whatever. Okay, you don't need permission to be a novelist. This is the good thing. <laughs> the bad thing is there are no rules to follow either. And uh, people always have their own individual take on it. I don't know a single author who just sat down and became an author overnight. Most of us have had a very checkered background in one way or another. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Ian Rankin. He's a Scottish author. Very, very good. One of my favorites and a good friend. Yeah. But uh, before I knew him personally, I was reading his books. And I would read the little bio in the back, and it would always give his previous occupations as including tax collector and swine herd. And <laughs> so when I finally met him, I said, well, I have to ask Ian, what is it about? How did you come to be a swine herd? I don't care how you got to be a novelist. I want to hear about the pigs. And. Um, he said that, well, when he was younger, he and his wife had got jobs as domestic servants on a French winery estate. And his wife took care of the interior domestic things, and he took care of the, of the outside things, including slopping the hogs and so forth. And he said that it was a very old-fashioned estate. When they did the harvest, they actually did, in fact, strip off and stomp the grapes, and everyone got very drunk. And he said, so they did that. And uh, consequently, everyone went to sleep it off, including him. Well, when he got up several hours later, he realized that he 
had not yet fed the hogs. And so he went out and he found a large tub full of the discarded wine skin, or grape skins from the stomping. And so he tossed these into the pig's trough and the pigs, of course, went after them. What he hadn't realized was that the uh, grape skins had been standing in the sun for several hours and the pigs all died of alcohol poisoning. <laughs> Yes. He said that was the end of his career as a swine herd, so he thought he'd better write novels. <laughs> yes, well, luckily, none of my previous careers have come to quite such a dramatic conclusion, but I have had a few. Uh, let me see, I had the postdoc appointment where my job was to butcher seabirds. Luckily, I didn't have to kill them. They came pre-killed from Canada and frozen, but it was my job to take something like a gannet Gannets are these big diving birds that have a wing spread of about six feet, and they dive from about 50 feet up. Consequently, their heads are made of solid concrete because they strike the water that way. And so I was supposed to reduce all of these different birds to 15 different body components, which I could then analyze for their protein, water, and fat content. Yes, don't ask why, but uh, that was my job. Anyway, I learned to uh, pluck and reduce a gannet in about three hours flat, but the hard part was the head because you had to use the hammer and chisel, you know, to break the skull and pour the brain out, which was part of the uh, part of the components that we wanted. That was probably my most disgusting job. I couldn't read. I couldn't eat fried chicken for a year after that. But <clears throat> And the next one was a little easier. I was a postdoc at UCLA replacing a scientist on sabbatical. So I took over his lab and his six graduate students and two Russian scientists who were studying with him. And uh, after the Russians left, uh, the next day, uh, an FBI agent showed up in my office, with two of them, with a little warrant badge and so forth. And uh, one of them dramatically introduced himself as Special Agent Justice. And I said, of course you are. <laughs> but, <laughs> that actually turned out to be his real last name. But <laughs> anyway, they wanted to interview me about, uh, about this uh, particular Russian. And uh, I, I told them about him, and I said, look, if if uh, this gentleman is the best the KGB can do, we have nothing to worry about. <laughs> but then I mentioned the, uh, the second Russian, and they said, oh, we didn't know about him. And I said, maybe we do have something to worry about. But <laughs> anyway, it was a more interesting job in that, in that one. What I had to do was uh, take high-speed motion picture films of boxfish. And uh, the reason we were doing this is because, you may know this, those of you who are runners and so forth, but the more you run or the more you exercise, the more oxygen you use. So if you take a person or an animal and you put them in a sealed compartment with you know, a set amount of oxygen and you make them exercise faster and faster, their oxygen consumption goes up, the amount of oxygen in the tank goes down. And so you get this nice 45 degree angle graph, you know, more oxygen, more exercise. Well, boxfish don't do that. A boxfish, in case you have never seen one, is very aptly named as a little box of uh, you know, hard uh, shell. And uh, their fins are just on the outside. They're not like regular fish where they, uh, they swim in this salmoniform uh, motion. They have a stracheiform motion because they are stracheidae. So um, they swim like this, and their little tail goes like that. But that's all the maneuvering they can do. And the funny thing about them is if you make a boxfish exercise, they will go faster and faster and faster, looking agitated as they do, and uh, they use more and more oxygen up to a point, and then they go faster and faster, but they don't use any more oxygen. And so we said, how are they doing that? This is really cool. Yeah, so the person I was working with had several hypotheses to, uh, to account for that, but the first one of those was maybe they're doing what people do. You know, when you walk faster and faster, at some point you shift into a run because that's more efficient for the speed you're going, and at that point your oxygen use will drop slightly. It goes back up if you keep running. But uh, we were thinking maybe the, uh, these guys have, are doing something special with their fins. So I was having to uh, do high-speed motion pictures. Well, this was back in the 19. 1980s, late 1980s. Conse <clears throat> Consequently, I had to shoot my film and then take it to the CBS TV studio to have it processed. We talked them into it as a public service. So, you know, I would go down behind the Johnny Carson show stage and, and give them my fish films, and then I would go back and pick them up the next day. It was an interesting place to work. Also, it was uh, we lived in Burbank, and this was when I started writing uh, Walt Disney comic books on the side. Um, I'd been reading comic books since I was three years old. That's how my mother taught me to read. And I kept on reading them. And while I was working at UCLA, I'd 
picked up one at the grocery store, and I said, well, this is pretty bad. I bet I could do better myself. And such was my state of mind that I found out the name of the editor who handled that line, and I wrote him this very rude letter saying, dear sir, I've been reading your, uh, your comic books for 25 years. They've been getting worse and worse. I said, I'm, I'm not sure that I could do better myself, but I'd like to try. Now, luckily, I hit a man named uh, Del Connell, who was a gentleman with a sense of humor. He wrote back and said, okay, try. <laughs> and he sent along a format so I could see what, uh, what shape the manuscript should be. So I wrote him a story. He didn't buy it, but he did something much more valuable. He told me what was wrong with it. So he did buy my second story, and he continued to buy my stories for another 18 months, at the end of which the powers that be at Disney said, we've got 40 years of Carl Barks scripts in our file. Why are we buying new ones? And they stopped buying new ones. <laughs> Uh, so that was my short-lived comic book career, but I still get, get a dozen or so stories out of it, uh, which was good by contrast with what I was doing at work. Um, anyway, I had to build a, a water tunnel and make the fish swim in it. It has a fan at one end, and fish will normally face into a current, so it was not a problem to get them going in the right direction. But you turn on the fan, and they would start swimming like this, and you turn it up, and they swim like this, and you turn it up, and they'd be going... And finally, they'd be going, oh, and they just <laughs> fall over backwards, and we shoot hastily, turn it out, and pull them out with a net, and take them off to recover. You know, we were not killing them. And, uh, and then, you know, you'd process the film and so forth. So that's what I spent another uh, few years doing. But uh, at the age of 35, I said to myself, well, you know, Mozart was dead at 36. If you want to write a book, maybe you should get started. And so I said, okay, on my next birthday, I will begin writing a book. Um, I didn't, I, I'd to this point, written all kinds of things. I'd written, you know, doctoral dissertations. My PH dissertation was titled Nest Site Selection in the Pinion J, Gymnorhinus cyanocephalus. Or as my husband says, why birds build nests where they do and who cares anyway. <laughs> But, you know, it was a 400-page dissertation or, um, let's see, a mo an 800-page monograph on dietary habits of the birds of the Colorado River Valley. You might notice a trend here, you know, 400 pages, 800 pages. Um, but I also, you know, wrote uh, computer documentation. I wrote software reviews for the computer press and, uh, you know, other things like this. Um, Back in the day, my father would say to me, you're such a poor judge of character, you're bound to marry some bum, he said. So be sure you get a good education to support your children. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is how I ended up with, this, with three science degrees. <laughs> but, you know, I still wanted to write novels and so forth. But in the course of my previous career, I had gotten all kinds of, uh, of experience in writing, just not writing novels. I did not marry a bum. I married a very nice man whom I still have 45 years later. And thank you. <laughs> mm. And my husband thanks you. <laughs> but uh, he did quit work three months after our first child was born in order to start his own business. And I do have to say that uh, between an entrepreneur and a bum, there's not that much to choose <laughs> in terms of financial stability. Now, uh, luckily, his business got going fairly, uh, fairly quickly and, and, and did quite well. But for the first two or three years, I was our sole support, and they don't pay assistant biology professors that much. So at this point, the need to earn extra money arose. And so I said, well, what can I do to earn a little extra money, you know, other than prostitution in the home? And uh, I said, well, I know how to write, I mean, you know, I, I'm grammatical, I know punctuation and all that, and I know quite a lot about computers. This happened as an accident when I was, all of the things in my life have happened as accidents, including meeting my husband. I met him in the French horn section of the Arizona marching band. <laughs> but, but anyway, in this particular instance, uh, the accident had more to do with, uh, with the, my job. That is, I was hired at Arizona State University because they had money allocated for the position, but as they said, we have this money, but it's soft money. If we don't spend it, they'll take it away, so you're hired. And they said, uh, this is how government works, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and they were saying, uh, so we don't actually have anything for you to do. We would like for you to develop your own research, but while you're doing it, maybe you could help Bob here, who's the assistant professor, or the assistant director with his data. I said, Bob has you know, 10 years worth of data in his back room, and you have a computer background, by which they meant I had one class in Fortran programming, but it was one more than any of them had, and so they said, so you can help Bob get his data into the computer. This was like 1981, 
microcomputers, as they were called, were just barely coming into offices and universities at the time. And they still thought that you poured data in the top and then you got reports out of the bottom. So it was my job to figure out how to get the top off the computer and get the data into it. So I spent the next 18 months of my life uh, writing Fortran programs to analyze the contents of bird gizzards. Um, it's, there's actually a reason why I'm telling you this. <laughs> there's a reason why I write long books. It's because I like digressions. But anyway, <laughs> at the end of this 18 months of, of work, I said, there's maybe five other people in the entire world who are interested in bird gizzards, but it would save each of them 18 months worth of work if they knew about these programs I've written. I was thinking, there must be other people out there who are you know, employing this, this new tool, computers, and doing science. Why is there no way in which we can communicate. So I took out uh, a little ad in the uh, newsletters of all the scientific societies I could find, and I explained what I was doing, and I said, I know there's other people out there doing this. Why don't you write to me? If there's enough of us, maybe we can put together a little newsletter of our own. So I got 300 letters in two months, and I took these to the director of my, of my center, and I said, well, I'm not having any luck getting money out of the NSF, but I think I've started something here. Can you front me a little money from petty cash and I'll see what I can do? So he gave me $250. I printed up some brochures and I took them to the next uh, conference that I was going to and handed them out on the floor to people. Well, I raised enough money in charter subscriptions to start uh, Science Software Quarterly, which was a scholarly journal for scientists who used computers in their work which was fun. Anyway, I ran that for about eight years and I developed you know, seminars for in, an international group of scientists who wanted to come learn about laboratory automation and, and data acquisition and that kind of stuff. All of which is just to explain how it was that I had a second career at the time. So I was teaching uh, and I was a university professor and I was doing my own research, but I also developed this secondary uh, career. When the need to earn extra money arose, I said, okay, I know about computers and I can write. So I wrote a quick query letter to Byte and InfoWorld and PC Mag, and I sent it with a copy of my science software quarterly and a copy of a comic book that I'd done for Walt Disney called Nutrition Adventures with Orange Bird. And it was a real short query. It said, Dear Sirs, as you can see from the enclosed, you won't find anyone who knows more about scientific and technical software than I do, and at the same time can write so as to appeal to a broad popular audience. Well, this got immediate results, and you know, within a few months, I was making as much freelancing for the computer press as I was at the university, which just goes to show how badly they pay assistant professors. But um, anyway, at the time when I made up my mind to write a book, I was 36 years old. I had two full-time jobs and three children under the age of six. So I don't want anyone telling me that they don't have time to write a book. <laughs> if you want to write a book, you'll make the time. I mean, nobody finds time. It's not just lying around in the street, unfortunately. You have to make it or you don't have any. But, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who want to write a book, and they're all saying, well, how do you find the time and so forth? And my first question is always, says a lot of people, especially women, they say, well, I can't, I can't justify taking time away from my family, you know, to be doing something like writing, you know, this frivolous, silly thing. And uh, my first question is, do you watch television? I said, okay, do you feel like that's a waste of your time? <laughs> because, you know, it's a choice. Why don't you take one of the hours you'd spend watching television and work on your book? Because uh, I'd say it's fairly simple. I was talking to Rick Rankin, one of the new uh, cast members for the Outlander TV show. He was, uh, oh, <laughs> yes, he's very nice, <laughs> extremely charming. Yes, he uh, sort of walked into the makeup room, spotted me. We'd never met before. He walked over and kissed me. <laughs> I said, really? Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> Scotsmen are different, yeah, and they, they all do that, actually. But um, anyway, uh, he was talking to me later about writing and so forth. He said, you know, I've always wanted to write a book, but, you know, time. And I said, look, I said, if you have 10 minutes a day, uh, and you can do it every day, you can write a book. I said, take that 10 minutes and write, okay? If that's all you got, that's all you got. But do it the next day. I said, if you write 10 minutes every day, you will have a book within a year. It may not be a big book, but you'll have a book. I said, if you don't do that, you won't have a book. It's that simple. You know, you have time. It doesn't need to be a big amount of time. Lots of people think, oh, I can't possibly write unless I have eight hours a day and individual support and a room of my own, and, you know, everybody is keeping everybody away from me so that I can write, and it kind of doesn't work that way. You know, you write anyway is what it comes down to. So anyway, I, I kind of knew that <laughs> because of what else I was doing. And so I just involved uh, the writing into my regular routine. Um, but I went immediately uh, to think, what am I going to write? 
um, because I read everything and lots of it. And I said, well, maybe I should write a mystery. I love mysteries. And I said, no, mysteries uh, have plots. I'm not sure I can do that. And uh, well, I never had. And so I said, OK, what's the easiest thing to write? No point making it hard. And so I thought, well, for me, maybe a historical novel would be the easiest thing to write. I was a research professor. I knew my way around a library. I said, it seems easier to um, look things up than to make them up. And if I turn out to have no imagination, I can steal things from the historical record, which actually works pretty well. And so I said, all right, mm, historical novel. Where shall I set this? Because I've got no background in history, just the six hours of Western civilization they make you take as an undergraduate. And so any time would do as well as another. And uh, so I said, OK, let me think about this. And so I was thinking, you know, 15th century Venice, you know, American Civil War, what sounds interesting? Well, in this malleable frame of mind, I happened to see a really old Doctor Who rerun on public television. And this, thank you. <laughs> yes, it was one of the really old ones. It was Patrick Troughton, the second doctor. For those of you who may not be familiar with Doctor Who, uh, it's a really old, really long-running show done in the UK. Originally as a kid's show, but now much more adult. Uh, the thesis or the premise of the show is that the doctor is a time lord from the planet Gallifrey who travels through space and time having adventures. And along the way, he picks up companions from different periods of Earth's history. Well, in this particular show, he had picked up a young Scotsman from 1745. And this was a you know, nice looking young man who appeared in his kilt. And I said, well, that's rather fetching. <clears throat> I found myself still thinking about this the next day in church. And I said, uh, <laughs> I said, well, you know, you want to write a book. It doesn't really matter. Fine, let's start there. Scotland, 18th century. So that's where I began, knowing nothing about Scotland or the 18th century, having no plot, no outline, and no characters, just the rather vague images conjured up by the notion of a man in a kilt, which is, of course, a very powerful and compelling image. <laughs> In fact, uh, some years later, my sixth book, which is a very lucky book for me, I won several awards, including the Corina International Prize for Fiction, which is cool, and I got to go to Germany to accept it. Well, while I was there, the German editor had me interviewed by everybody in the German media from you know, the tabloid newspapers on up. And toward the end of this very long week, I was talking to a nice man from a literary magazine. And he said, oh, I've read all of your work. You know, your characters are so three-dimensional. Your narrative drive is tremendous. You know, your imagery is just transcendent. I'm thinking, yes, yes, go on. And uh, <laughs> instead, he said, uh, there's just this one thing, I wonder. Uh, can you explain to me, what is the appeal of a man in a kilt? Well, he was a man <laughs> and a German. And uh, anyway, I was really tired, or I might not have said it, but I just looked at him for a minute and I said, I suppose it's the idea that you could be up against a wall with him in a minute. <laughs> yes, that is actually it, in case any of you gentlemen were wondering. <laughs> But um, anyway, <laughs> man in a kilt, as I say. So um, that's why I chose Scotland, and uh, that, that is why I chose Scotland in the 18th century. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so anyway, I went immediately to the library and began looking up Scotland in the 18th century. Now, the only thing I actually knew about books or writing a novel was that it should have conflict. You know, I had a minor in English, and that was the sole sum of my knowledge from that uh, conflict. And so you don't look for conflict in Scotland in the 18th century for very long without running smack into Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobite Rebellion. And I said, well, that looks like plenty of conflict. Fine, we'll use that. And so that's where I began. I was just doing research at the same time as I was writing and you know, just beginning feeble stabs at writing. I was just putting down bits and pieces of, of you know, just Im vaguely imagined things with my man in a kilt. And uh, none of those ever made it into the published book. But as I was working with this, I was thinking, well, you know, essentially it's Scots versus English here. And I must have a lot of Scotsmen, of course, for the kilt factor. But it would be a good idea if I had a female character to play off these guys, you know, sexual tension, that sort of thing. I said, so if I make her an English woman, we will have lots of conflict. So on the third day of writing, I introduced this English woman. No idea who she was, what she was doing there, what she was going to carry out on the story. But I loosed her into a cottage full of Scotsmen to see what she'd do. Well, she walked in, and they were all seated around a fire muttering to each other. They turned around and stared at her. And I'm thinking, why? Does she look funny? You know, what's going on here? Anyway, one of them drew himself up, and he said, My name's Dougal Mackenzie, and who are you? 
And uh, she uh, looked up, and without my stopping to think, I just typed, my name's Claire Elizabeth Beecham, and who the hell are you? <laughs> and I said, okay, you don't sound at all like an 18th century person. So I fought with her for several pages, trying to beat her into shape and make her talk like an 18th century person. But she wasn't having any. She just kept making smart-ass modern remarks. And uh, she also took over and started telling the story herself. And I said, okay, I'm not going to fight with you all the way through this book. I said, no one's ever going to see this. It doesn't matter what bizarre thing I do. Go ahead and be modern. I'll figure out how you got there later. So it is all her fault that there's time travel in these books. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, once having made that decision, well, obviously anything else went. So, you know, I, while the uh, historical background is as accurate as history itself is, which means, which is to say, not necessarily all the truth, but it was all the truth that was written down. Anyway, the background is very accurate, uh, but part of the art of immersion in popular fiction is by making little connections with your readers amongst those details they can identify with. And I tell you what, if you are very, very good at making the details of daily life believable, then your readers will follow you right over a cliff when you ask them to believe in time travel. <laughs> that's how you do it. So there's a lot of research involved in these books, but you know, I was a research professor and that's how it works. Well, let's see, how are we doing for time? Okay, we have two minutes before we start questions and so forth, so that is just about enough time to explain how I got from this point to actually being published, because this was this book I was never gonna show anyone. Well, what happened was that owing to my, uh, my computer background and so forth, I had stumbled into a group of people called the CompuServe Literary Forum, it just by accident while I was doing research for one of the software reviews I was doing. And this was like a 24-hour electronic cocktail party amongst people who liked books. There are many, many readers and some writers of all degrees of ability, but it, you know, it was a great place for, and for someone with two social, uh, two full-time jobs and uh, three small children, it was the ideal social life. So I signed on and was hanging around there. Well, I was certainly not gonna tell any of these people what I was doing, but one day I found myself engaged in an ongoing argument with a gentleman about what it feels like to be pregnant. And uh, <laughs> he said, oh, I know what that's like. My wife's had three children. <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I said, yeah, Buster, I said, I've had three children. And he said, well, t can you tell me what it's like? I said, I can, yes, but it's kind of complex. I don't think I could fit it in a 30-line message slot, which is what we had. I said, I tell you what, though, I have this little piece I wrote a few months ago in which a uh, woman tells her brother in some detail what it's like to be pregnant. I'll put it up for you, and you can, you can see. So I put up this piece in order to win the argument, which I did. And... Uh, Everyone who'd been following the argument went and read the piece, and they came rushing back, and they said, this is great, what is it? And I said, I don't know. And uh, they said, well, where's the beginning? And I said, I haven't written that yet. And they said, well, put up some more of it. So over time, I began putting up uh, more little pieces, just, I don't write in a straight line, I don't write with an outline, I write where I can see things happening. But if I had a piece that I thought was, you know, comestible as it was, you know, fit for human consumption, I would put it up every two or three months. People got more and more interested. Anyway, the bottom line is that a friend online who had read my pieces and the response to them said, uh, I know you must be ready to look for an agent. Would you like me to recommend you to mine? And I had actually researched his agent and I said, that would be great, John. Thank you. And I was afraid that John would leave CompuServe or be run over by a bus before I finished the book. So I said, yes, go ahead. And so he wrote, uh, Perry Knowlton was the agent's name. He wrote Perry a nice note saying, Everybody thinks this woman is hilarious. You know, she's probably worth looking at. And I followed that with my own note. And I said, dear Mr. Knowlton, I've been writing and selling nonfiction by myself for some years, but I understand now that I need a good literary representation. You've been recommended to me by John and Judy and all these people. Um, I said, I have this very long novel. I don't want to waste your time. Would you be willing to read excerpts from it? I didn't tell him I wasn't done writing it. Excerpts were all I had. <laughs> <laughs> But he very kindly called back and said, yes, he would read my excerpts. And uh, the basis was he took me on on the basis of an unfinished first novel, which was not common then. It's not common now either, but very lucky for me. Anyway, in the fullness of time, I did finish writing the book, and I gave it to him, and I said, uh, I can tell there's more to this story, but I thought I should stop while I could still lift it. And he said, okay. And I said, but you can tell people there's more if they're interested. So luckily, he sent it out to five editors who he thought might like it, and within four days, three of them had called back with offers to buy it, which was also lucky. So he negotiated amongst them for two weeks and came back with a three-book contract, and bing, I was a novelist. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, thank you very much. Well, I think we have now reached the time for questions, and we have this enterprising young man who has uh, got the microphone already. We have a microphone at the beginning of each aisle, so any of you who are interested in asking a question, you can come up there. Okay, uh, yes, sir. Well, Diana, I love the modern world, and yesterday my muse and I beamed you into our kitchen, so I met you yesterday already. I come from New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've spent the last three years doing the third polish on something that I've been working on. And I love your story about how you got an attorney. So how many books have you sold? How many books? Uh, 28 million. Well, congratulations. So you, Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, my... That was my question. How many books have you sold? That was an easy one. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Ten, you, sir. I'm a uh, recent convert. Thank you. <laughs> to, to your books. My wife introduced me to them. To them Wonderful. And, uh, mm -hmm. and they're quite enjoyable. I'm a history teacher. Um, so as you're writing these books and as you see this progress, mm -hmm. I, I know there's a ninth book coming out sometime. Sometime, yes. <laughs> um, can you can you give us any hints on on where that may take us? What location oh. the main characters may be at? Where may the next book yeah. take us in terms of yeah. time, location, etc.? Yeah. Well, vaguely, yes. Uh, we are in North Carolina. Uh, he's asking about the ninth book and what what hints I can give you about it. Uh, I have a title for it. It's called "Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone." And that comes from a, uh, thank you, it comes from a, a bit of beekeeping lore, which is common to the Celtic countries, but you find it also in other parts of Europe and America. And it's based on the idea that if you are a beekeeper, you tend your hives every day. And since bees are social insects, they need to know what's going on in the community, not just their own hive. So you tell them the news of your community, who's come into the community, who's gone, who's been born, who's died, what's going on. Because if you don't, and the bees find out, they'll be angry and swarm and fly away and you won't have any honey. So you always go and tell the bees what's going on. Now as to who is gone or where they are going and when or if ever they will come back, that we don't know. It may apply to more than one person, I can tell you that much. <laughs> but, that was the other question, was who is going to tell the going, bees? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, well, I don't know. Clara is usually the beekeeper, but yeah. you know. <laughs> on the other hand, if it's her that's going, she would be telling someone else to go tell the bees that, I, that I've gone. Yeah, Thank on the you. other hand, there may be someone else and she's telling the bees about things. Or, as I say, there may be more than one person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Diana. Hi. I just want, I'm sorry, I'm short. Um, <laughs> for one thing, I want to say congratulations on being a granny. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, yes I am a new grandmother. <laughs> um, but I also wanted to ask how much were you aware of early American um, history? of what was going on, you know, in terms of colonial times, American Revolution, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth, before you actually started approaching that. Oh, how much did I know about early American history and yeah. revolutionary times before I began writing the books? Yeah. Uh, just what you would learn in elementary school in the 1960s, yeah. So was anything mm -hmm. surprising? <laughs> Which was a heck of a lot more than you'd learn now, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, it depends on location. Yeah. But how much, did anything surprise you that you came across? Did anything surprise me from the things that I learned later? Yeah. Oh, yes, all kinds of things. But, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything in particular. Well, I know more about George Washington's false teeth now than I did. They weren't necessarily all made of hippopotamus ivory, but a lot of them were. Yeah. Uh, no, you learn all kinds of interesting things, like uh, General Nathaniel Green was a Quaker by profession, which makes it rather odd that he became a Revolutionary War general. But it turns out that as he was growing up, his father disliked books, and he forbade his son to read because he thought books would separate you from God, you know, by distracting you and so forth. And uh, young Nathaniel didn't bide with this, so he snuck off and read anyway. But uh, this, this fission, you know, made him decide that he didn't want to be a Quaker anymore if they were so narrow-minded as not to read books. <laughs> now, of course, they weren't all, but his father was. Anyway, so that's what uh, caused him to go off and read. And what he was reading was military history. And he became more and more engaged in this. And finally, he said, all right, I'm not a Quaker anymore. <laughs> I'm going to take up military. And he was a very good general. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Diana. Hi. Um, I'm from Havelock, North Carolina. Oh, very and, nice. And I know you've been there because you mm -hmm. went for the um, 300th anniversary of New Bern. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, how did you come across wanting to have Jamie and Claire Frazier go to Fraser Ridge in North Carolina? Why that spot? Why there? 
And the other part of the question is, if the filming keeps continuing, if you can have them film in New Bern, North Carolina, <laughs> because uh, we would love to have them there by Tryon Palace and be able to, to do some of that. And because in Scotland, you just don't experience the heat you mm -hmm, do in mm -hmm, Eastern North mm -hmm. Carolina. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the question was first, how did I uh, come to set Fraser's Ridge in North Carolina? And the second was, is, can I arrange to have part of the show filmed in North Carolina for the next season? Yeah, that unfortunately is beyond my control. <laughs> part of it is that they have this huge studio in Cumbernauld, which is just outside Glasgow, which expands with each season, so it's immense. And they do all of the indoor shooting and some of the outdoor shooting actually within this facility. <clears throat> so they're not going to go build another one in North Carolina, is the bottom line. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. As for the outer stuff, uh, there are parts of Scotland that can be used, but they also have another European location that you know, they can use for the more forested parts of, of things. The thing also is that uh, Outlander is not a, not a union show. You don't need to be in the UK, whereas you pretty much do need to be in the States. And so just the legalities involved in that, plus the taxes, plus the idea of moving a production that size all the way to North Carolina, no, not happening. But as for why I set them there, uh, that's where the Scots went after Culloden. Uh, the, uh, many people were transported, many people left voluntarily because there was nothing left for them in Scotland. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've had a cold all week, so. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> yeah, all right. Um, so about half the Scottish emigrants went uh, up straight up the coast to Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. So it's called Nova Scotia, New Scotland. That's where they settled. But the other half went straight up the Cape Fear River. That's okay, I've got a, a drink, thank you. Um, went straight up the Cape Fear River and into the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee because the mountains reminded them of Scotland. And so that's why Fraser's Ridge is within 10 miles of Boone, but I couldn't tell you in which direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you. Hi. Uh, my name's Karen. I am an obsessionac. Thank you. <laughs> um, I write for the Outlander cast blog, so this Lovely. question is for uh, on behalf of everybody. And I'm going to blatantly steal something from the first session, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to add my own to that. Um, okay. How much time do you spend thinking? That was the question. And where do you do it best? How much time do I spend thinking, and where do I do it best? I think all the time. I mean, uh, yeah. If you mean about books, I, I still yes. think about books all the time. It's just in the back of my mind. And, you know, I'm doing other things, of course, but every once in a while I will just get an idea and it pops into place. And as my husband says, you have that goofy look on your face again. Are you having book ideas? <laughs> and I say yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, I don't have, like, regimented hours during which I think, you know. And, uh, and likewise, I don't have a place. As far as the writing goes, all I need is a laptop computer, and uh, I'm not there. I'm within the book, so I can actually do it anywhere. I've done it in halls like this and in airports and, you know, pretty much anywhere. Well, thank you for all You're of welcome. that, for the kilts, and for that visual about up against the wall in a minute. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Feel free. <laughs> thank you. And you? Uh -huh. Hi. Um, I wrote my question down because that's usually how I go. Um, where did you get the idea of giving Brianna and Roger's daughter Mandy the ability to sense Jem's location, and will that be built upon in the new book? Oh, well, where did I get the idea of allowing Mandy, Roger and Brianna's uh, daughter, to sense uh, Jemmy's location? And, uh, and will that be used in future books? Well, plainly it will, yeah. But um, as to where it was, it, it was just there. Excuse me. Um, and, yeah, I mean, she just said that. I can, I can feel him. And uh, I was thinking, oh, well, of course you can, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, I wondered if it was reciprocal, which it turned out to be, you know, that they both can. The uh, hypothesis here would be that we know that the ability to time travel is genetic. And, uh, well, I mean, think about it. How many of you can roll your tongues? Do they just go, mm, or can you? Okay. If you can't do then you can't do it. That's all there is to it. You can think about it all you try want. You can't do it. And the same thing with time travel. If you are genetically endowed to do that, you can do that. Otherwise, you can't. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, so I assume that you, have, you must have one gene to time travel. Brianna has one gene from Claire. Um, but, you know, genes, as we know, occur in paired alleles. So what if uh, we know Bri has one, Roger may have one, he may have two. But either way, Jemmy and Mandy have the potential of having two. So I said, what if they both do have two. So that gives you the ability to you know, steer through time, and they both seem to be somewhat more flexible time travelers than their parents. But what if it also allows you to recognize other time travelers? 
And I was thinking, so they can recognize each other. See, the thing is, they can recognize their parents as well as, as Mandy does when she tells them where, where Roger is. So they, they, they have this ability to, to recognize another time traveler when they see them rather than, than wait. And that may come into play somewhere else. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, hello. I'd Hi. like to um, thank you, Ms. Gabaldon, for thank all you. your work, um, in particular in light of what Mr. McCullough mentioned about bringing history to life. Thank you. Um, I would, especially in my own family, I would say that my now college-age daughter found no joy in history oh, until wonderful. she mm -hmm. read your, your books. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that brings it to home. And I would like to, in honor of her, ask, because she is an aspiring writer, uh, how do you work through writer's blocks? Oh, how do you work through writer's block? Um, it's real simple, but also horrifying. Uh, you can just keep writing anyway. I mean, really, just keep putting down words, and eventually it will let go. Now, I can expand on that a little bit. What I do may not work for her because it has to do with the way my brain is wired up. I think I have a rather beneficent form of ADHD in that I can't concentrate on something for more than about 20 minutes unless it's really engaging. But um, what I learned to do easy, early on was to switch rapidly from one project to the next. I usually work on three, four, five, six projects at once. So I'll begin, say, with a grant proposal, which is the most horrible thing to write and I would get you know, two-thirds of the way down the page, it would stick. Well, everybody gets stuck at some point, and they get up, go to the bathroom, get the drink, take the dog for a walk. Some of them don't come back, and that's why they don't finish their books. Um, I couldn't do that because I had to get, keep getting paid. So I would come to this sticking point, and I, without stopping, I would pick up the next project on my software review pile, start the review. Then I'd check with the draft of the proposal if it was still stuck. I would uh, then pick up um, the scene I was working on for the novel, work on that till it got stuck. And so it would keep me circling through these things and I would not get up and so at the end of the night I would end up you know with two pages of the grant proposal and half of a software review and maybe three quarters of a finished scene but I would have work and so you know this is another thing to do you know if you are stuck on what you're doing do something else but it also involves writing because those synapses keep working and eventually something comes loose if all comes uh, if everything else fails work on what you're supposed to be working on but just put down anything that comes into your mind that's connected with it don't try to you know organize or plan plot or anything like that, just you know, let the words come and then it, usually it comes unstuck within a couple of paragraphs. You, you may have to do it more than one day in a row. <laughs> My daughter Amelia thanks you. Sure thank, thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I want to thank you personally. I know everyone here feels the same way. I didn't know about your books until I watched the television show mm -hmm. and then I've read all of them. And it's just like open up this whole world to me. So thank you, thank you. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I see that you're a consultant on the show. And it says, you know, mm -hmm. um, what's, how do you feel like when they like vary? I know they have to vary things from the book to do to mm -hmm. condense it mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. show. But how, I mean, I know it's an open-ended question, but how do you feel about? you know, changes they make? Do they consult you about them or? How do I feel about changes made by the show to the right. original story? Well, they pretty much have to change it because they've only got 10 hours to work with right. um, and they're big books. The other thing is that, you know, weekly television, it's episodic, meaning that you have one hour and that hour has to have its own little dramatic uh, arc that comes to a dramatically satisfying end. Well, the book is not arranged in neat little dramatic arcs. So what they do is they take the book apart. They call it breaking script and then they take pieces out of out of this broken pile and they reassemble them into those little climatic things. So in the process they lose some things, they have to invent some other things to get from point A to point B, but the overall uh, impression is still that of the original book. I think they do a beautiful job with that. There are occasional spots where they, uh, where one script writer will have if to my mind, completely misinterpreted a character and on those occasions I will point that out with some force, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it often, but on one, uh, one set, uh, it started out with something really, and anyway, I wrote back and I said, I don't use language bad enough to describe how much I hate this. <laughs> but, you know, I don't do that often, and when I do, they're inclined to listen to me, and they did do something about it. I mean, normally they're very good about, you know, about soliciting my comments and paying attention to what I think. And, you know, I don't make a lot of adverse comments. Usually I'll say, this is great, I love this, this is wonderful, I would never have thought of that terrific. But, you know, 
know, every once in a while I'll say, I'll, I'll say look, you know, if I tell you what, you honestly, truly, you cannot fatally cut someone's throat without having a lot of blood. Because, yeah, I got back this footage and there was just this sort of gently oozing you know, <laughs> wound, but no blood on the clothes or anything like that. I said, look, you can't do that. If you're going to kill someone, you're, you're slicing at least one of the carotid arteries. Blood is spraying everywhere. I mean, you've got to have more blood. And so, you know, <laughs> well, see, they're not going to reshoot scenes just to uh, satisfy my technical things. But the thing is, there's this thing called VFX, which means special effects, and they can do things. Uh, frequently, I'll see notes on the on the rough footage that they send me that says VFX, add more blood. And so I know they can do that. So I'll say, look, add more blood, <laughs> lots more blood. So we'll see how that works. But yeah, anyway, they, they listen to me, and nine times out of ten, they'll do something in response. The tenth time, they'll tell me why that's impossible. You know, the logistics just don't let them do this or that. It's too expensive, et cetera. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Diana. Thank you. Um, I wanted to let you know that my family had an episode, not an episode, my first granddaughter, mm. um, unbeknownst to her mother, prenatally had serious health defects. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and only lived 35 hours. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I warned my daughter about reading Dragonfly and Amber, and she did read it, and she did watch. Yeah. Faith Cat's performance was amazing. And, she was. Yeah. And, you know, your writing mm -hmm. um, helped us through that period of time. So when you announced that you were going to be a grandmother, I prayed for you. Well, thank you so much. I prayed for your granddaughter. Mm -hmm. I hope Santi is well. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know how does being a grandmother or does it impact your writing from here going forward? How does it impact your life and how does it impact your writing? <laughs> well, I don't know. I've only been a grandmother for six weeks. I haven't written that much yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the six best weeks of your life. <laughs> yeah, well, see, uh, Claire has been a grandmother for a lot longer than I have. But, uh, you know, I have had children. You know, I know what it's like to deal with children, both my own and others and so forth. So, you know, you use as much of your own experience as you have. Uh, you mentioned Katrina and her fabulous performance. Uh, in Dragonfly Amber, you know, as, uh, as a pregnant woman and, and losing the baby and all that. And uh, she wrote to me ahead of time and she said, can you tell me what it's like to be pregnant? Because I never have been and so forth. And so, you know, I, I just did a, a brain dump for her and you know, told her everything I knew about that and so forth. And I have been fortunate enough never to experience a stillbirth, but I have talked to people who have and, uh, and also the medical people who attend them. So I told her what I knew from that angle as well. She just did a fabulous job with it. She did. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Um, my favorite way to procrastinate my own writing is by doing research, going to the National Archives and reading letters and things like that. And I said, oh, I'm, right. I'm working on my novel by doing this, but I'm really not writing my novel. And you are such a historically detailed and generally detailed writer. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that your background helps you be more regimented in that. But I wondered um, what your approach is to researching and then integrating the research and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm keeping going with that schedule you described uh, while not mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sacrificing your eye for yes. detail. Well, that is a problem that I noticed with people who are writing historical fiction, which is, you know, you get so tangled up in the research that you never actually write the book. I know people who have been writing their novel for 10 years, and they've never put down a word. But they're just doing research. I guess research is fun. It's much less work than writing. Um, no, I am rather fortunate in the way that my brain works, which is in this very scattershot way. So I do the research and the uh, writing concurrently. You know, I'll be working on a scene, and I come to something I need to know. Well, I go to my research collection. I've got about 2,200 books on you know, early uh, on Scotland and early America and so forth. And, you know, or I'll go to the internet to, to look up, you know, a, a, char a historical character that I'm using. I'll say image, you know, show me what, you know, Tom Paine looked like and that sort of stuff. And I'll read stuff. And anyway, something in there, it, it will, I'll find what I needed to go on writing the scene, but I'll also find something else that stimulates another scene. I'll think, ah. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll immediately start writing that one down on a separate document, you know, just a, a quick sketch of whatever. And so, uh, I mean, the research just integrates itself, basically. I put in what I need to know, and uh, the research tells me all this other stuff that I didn't know I needed to know, but there it is. <laughs> That's very helpful. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Okay, you are my rock star. Thank you. <laughs> I am your number one fan. Thank you so much. I love yes, so much minutes. about you. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you, though, okay, I hit 50 and wrote the novel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm done with the novel, and Great. I've got friends going independent, independently mm -hmm. published, others telling me to try to go the query letter and the mainstream publishing. 
What made you, I know you did the CompuServe, but what, was it your your friend that, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is that what garnered you, like directed you to go that direction? With no, indep- independent, it's about a question about independent publishing versus mainstream publishing. Independent publishing didn't exist back in the day. It was not a question. But uh, given the, uh, the option, uh, definitely go for mainstream publishing to start with. It's uh, too complex for me to deal with here, but I'll talk to you later if you, if oh, you would like. Awesome. Yeah, and we have exactly two minutes, so I'm sorry for the rest of the people who have been standing in line, but I can take that question. Yeah. Hi, I'll be quick. Thanks so much for the stories. Mm-hmm. I was just wondering, in all your stories, do you ever regret the, any choices that you might have made? And specifically, would you have chosen another path for Murta? For who? Murta. Oh, Murta. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Do I ever regret uh, you know, killing people in my books, essentially, was the question. Um, well, see, I don't kill people. Uh, they die. I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, in fact, I frequently go out of my way to, to try not to kill them. I really did, and written in my own heart's blood. There's a very shattering death in that one, and I was thinking, surely there's some other way, but no, there wasn't. You know, once I heard that crack, you know, I was thinking, yep, there, yeah, he's gone. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and, you know, I, I just can't change those. But, but no, I don't plan them. So, you know, sometimes I regret that someone is gone. But, you know, uh, Murtaugh, you know, died at Culloden and part of the, and because he died. But part of the effect of that was, you know, that we are sensible of a personal loss, which you need to have. You know, if, if Jamie is surviving, which he was, you know, we need to lose someone that we care about, you know. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh-huh. And one more person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yay. Thank you very much, Diana. My question actually has specifically to do with the Outlander books. In uh-huh. I think it's book five, Nia Wenny mm-hmm. uh, tells Claire that when her hair is all white, that's when she'll be her most powerful. Yes. And really, I'm just wondering how white is Claire's hair right now, and can we expect even more uh-huh. powerful uh, <laughs> achievements? Yeah, no, uh, Claire doesn't have a mirror at this point, and, it, and someone mentions that to her. And so she asked her granddaughter, she said, you know, what color is my hair, expecting to hear brown or white. And Mandy looks at her and says, Randa says it's brindled. <laughs> so, so that's what it is. It's a mixture of um, um, brown, silver, white, etc. So she's not quite there yet, but we have two books to go. Thank you. Anyway, yeah, that's all the questions we have time for. Thank you. Thanks very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.